Thanks everyone for showing up. This is the uh, first time in three years that we've been together. So it's kind of nice to be back. Every time I see Steve Severson, I always am reminded how old I am because his hair is getting longer and everything on Kit Creighton's campus keeps changing. So uh, because we're not virtual, everyone's gonna have to pay attention this year. No more multitasking while you're doing your CLE on demand. But if you do wanna do CLE on demand, the Omaha Bar Association has a nice little library that you can pick from. A few thank yous to, uh, I'd like to get started with Professor Severson for keeping us on track, along with uh, J. Scott Paul for keeping us on track the last three years. Made sure we get our, got our ethics despite the pandemic. And uh, Professor Severson is gonna be retiring. So he's turned it over to Professor Fersche. And so I'd like to give a round of applause for Professor Severson for his work through the years. Thank you. And as always, thank you to Creighton University School of Law. Always a gracious host. They've partnered with Omaha Bar Association on this event for 17 years and given the Bar Association an office and a home in the law school for, uh, I mean, I think we're on year 50 uh, since the 1970s, uh, which is much appreciated. And a final thank you is to you, the members of the Bar Association. We're still trying to offer all the things that you guys have grown to know and love through the years, like the wine tasting, but we're also trying to be dynamic and trying new events, new CLEs, new social events, and also new philanthropic events. A couple of those that if you don't know about them, I'd like to highlight. The first one is the Omaha Bar Association Job Placement Service. Um, it's, it's brand new, got started in 2023. We're trying to pair up some good attorneys that are looking for jobs with some good firms that are also looking for good attorneys. Additionally, there's something called the Omaha Bar Association Giving Circle. And it's a capital group that's formed within the Bar Association where attorneys pitch in a little bit of their own money. Um, combined with some funds from the Omaha Community Foundation, we partnered with them to look for and give grants to deserving nonprofits in the Omaha community. If you are interested in getting involved in any of these things, you can feel free to visit the website, which we have on the screen behind us. Talk to me, I'm Ken Wentz at Jackson Lewis. And uh, or talk to one of our board members or Dave Summers. As mentioned before, this CLE is free to all members. If you happen to shell out $75 for this CLE and you wanna put that $75 toward an Omaha Bar Association membership, we'd love to have you. A list of our events in the immediate future for 2023 are in the folder on a bright yellow sheet that you really can't miss. We'd invite you to try it on for size and see if it fits. We think it will. Uh, now, again, thanks for attending, and I'd like to turn it over to Dean Fersche from the Creighton University School of Law. Thank you. Well, welcome, everybody. It's a pleasure to have you here for the 17th annual uh, Creighton School of Law and Omaha Bar Association Seminar on Ethics and Professionalism. Uh, I have introduced this uh, event four times now, and this is the first time it's been in person. And so I'm, I'm glad to see everybody here. It's kind of hard to believe that I've been here. Uh, we just completed our last day of classes, so it's a, it's a big day in a variety of ways. Um, we have graduation coming up on May 12th for the class of 2023. It's also my son's 18th birthday. Um, and so that uh, too makes it a big day for us. And, and of course, uh, Professor Steve Severson uh, for the last day of classes, um, he is completing his 18th year, I think, here. Uh, so again, congratulations, Steve, and thank you for all you've done, and, and, and uh, in part for this event. Uh, this has been something that has uh, certainly been going on a long time before I got here. I hope it uh, continues a long time after I'm here, because I think this is a really important gathering for our Bar Association, for our community, and our profession. Um, thanks to Scott Paul, and to Ken, and Dave Summers, uh, and others who have helped put this together. Um, I'm just really glad that we can all do this, and so thank you for being here. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, the first speaker, uh, who is the best law professor, certainly in my house. Um, uh, and, and, and honestly, and, and admitting my bias, one of the finest uh, 
teachers and people I know. So uh, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Kendra Fourche. Thank you, Dean Fourche, for that kind welcome. Um, and to the Omaha Bar Association for inviting me to fill some very big shoes. Um, it, it's an honor to follow in the footsteps of Steve, Se Steve Severson, who has uh, really served this organization uh, nobly for many years and has an obvious, obvious deep commitment to the ethical practice of law. Um, teaching professional responsibility is different than practicing, as you well know, um, but this is a nice overlap between those two worlds that we get to work with our students who are embarking on legal careers and then with those of you who have been doing this work and um, you know showing the way, uh, making the tough decisions and being sort of aware and cognizant of these uh, challenging issues that come up in practice. So uh, thank you to Steve for your service. Um, client solicitation, our topic for today, uh, is a touchy subject for lawyers to some extent because the perception of lawyers as um, ambulance chase chasers or overly aggressive um, sort of um, you know sharks is pervasive in our culture. Um, I mean, I know we like being portrayed as heroes a la my cousin Vinny, but unfortunately, the reality is that a lot of times when people think about attorneys, they think about sort of aggressive client uh, gathering tactics that make people nervous about being around lawyers. Um, despite that perception, um, there is obviously, as we know, some pretty broad prohibitions on clients' solicitation, partic particularly direct person-to-person solicitation. So there's a pretty big, big disconnect between what the rules actually say and what the perception is of how lawyers operate. So just a little historic background here um, and the overview. We're going to talk about history of client solicitation rules, the current rules, and then where do we go from here uh, because the rules actually are changing for the first time in a long time. So the history, um, in most professional ethics rules contexts, there is a pretty big evolution from uh, you know, a kind of a pendulum swing from loose or no regulation and permissive tactics to um, sort of lockdown uh, uh, rules that keep lawyers from engaging in whatever the perceived bad acts were, and then maybe a swing back toward a loosening of the regulations. Um, the best example I can give in terms of then and now, in ancient Roman times, when it comes to market regulation and advertising, in ancient Roman times, it was common practice for attorneys to hire what they called clappers, who would applaud after an attorney made a, an argument to a jury. Um, which I know would be nice, but I suppose it would be confused. Yes, thank you, Judge. <laughs> thank you for coming today. I'll step out. Um, so the, uh, the notion that lawyers were putting themselves in a position of sort of uh, misrepresenting perhaps their skills and advertising in aggressive ways uh, was then later um, sort of uh, treated with disdain and the rules against advertising and as we see them now in various uh, forms came into play. And then we see a shift back away from the very uh, restrictive forms of advertising. But specifically when it comes to market regulation, as we uh, see in client solicitation rules, rule 7.3 was born out of the, um, the current model rules of professional conduct were born out of the 1908 canons of professional ethics and the basis for those ethics was really an essay that was written by George Sar Sharswood in um, 1854. And he was the dean of the law school at Penn. Uh, he was also the chief justice of the Supreme Court in Pennsylvania. And he had an extremely um, limited view of aggressive tactics by lawyers to seek uh, client, you know, to get to get new clients. So he wrote in his 
uh, essay on professional eth ethics in 1854 that he was concerned about a horde of pedophaging, baritrous, money-making lawyers. Um, I think we can all agree we don't want to be pedophaging or baritrous, but I do think we want to be money-making. Um, I think that perhaps he had a different view of what it meant to be, um, you know, in the position of offering services to the public. He thought that the foundation of professional dignity was a lawyer who sat sort of passively behind a desk, was approached by people who maybe needed uh, representation, and that there would never be any sort of untoward outreach from a lawyer to an individual. Um, and so this idea that seeking clients is beneath the professional uh, sort of ethic that we all should uphold has been pervasive. It really, there hasn't been the pendulum swing. It was that you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't directly solicit clients. The rules in 1908, the first version of the rules reflected that um, sense of uh, concern for those tactics and that real uh, sense that we should not be engaging in direct client uh, uh, solicitation has continued today. There was a shift finally in the 1970s, the late, late 1970s, actually where the Supreme Court got involved in two cases that were decided on the same day that dealt with um, lawyers who were reaching out to clients for, um, for to, in order to represent them in different contexts. In one case, the court decided in Orlick that lawyers who are motivated by pecuniary gain should not be permitted, or in other words, should be, should be open to discipline or should be, avail, uh, should be allowed to be disciplined under the professional ethics rules because that violates, uh, and, and because it doesn't violate the First Amendment to regulate the market in that way. On the same day, the Supreme Court decided in Ray Primus, which was a case in which lawyers wrote to individuals that they had met with in the past. These are lawyers working for the ACLU. They had met with individuals in the past about perhaps bringing litigation against the state of South Carolina for um, forced uh, sterilization of people who had accepted uh, public assistance to for food stamps and those sorts of things. It was obviously a pretty egregious civil rights violation. The ACLU met with those potential clients and followed up in writing to ask if they wanted to be represented in litigation and then were disciplined by the South Carolina Bar for doing that, for reaching out to the clients um, after they'd already met with them. And the U.S. Supreme Court said in sort of opposite stance, um, distinguishing the uh, facts in Oralic that in that circumstance, when a lawyer is seeking to represent an individual for civil rights violations in a non-pecuniary circumstance, that that is a First Amendment violation to discipline the lawyer for that direct um, client solicitation. This was the first real loosening of the rules for direct client contact, potential client contact, and really, um, could have been the beginning of a pretty significant shift in the, the rules generally, but didn't actually make much of a difference in terms of how bar associations were adopting the rules. Um, there was a shift to recognize the difference between pecuniary and non-pecuniary gain, um, but otherwise the rules stayed pretty firmly intact that lawyers should not directly solicit um, clients. Okay. So looking at the current state of affairs, 2018, fast forward from 1978 to 2018, we do get finally a little bit of a change. The uh, model rules of professional conduct were changed to loosen again a little bit the prohibition on direct contact. Um, and so the definition of solicitation um, has a, was similar to what it has been. But part B here, I think, is the interesting part about the model rules. Um, part B says a lawyer shall not solicit professional employment by live person-to-person -person contact when a significant motive for the lawyer's doing so is the lawyer's or law firm's pecuniary gain, unless, and now we have a carve out, the contact is with a lawyer, person who is a family, has a family, close personal or prior business or professional relationship with the lawyer or law firm, or person who routinely uses for business purposes the type of legal services offered by the lawyer. So people, you know, uh, soliciting clients that you've worked with in the past 
is now um, not considered to be as onerous or as um, exerting as much pressure as maybe solicitation of a person who has never been a client before. But here's the part that was kind of the most significant change. Um, the rule comment two to rule 7.3 goes on to explain what live person-to-person -person contact means um, and describes that as in-person, face-to-face, live telephone or other real-time visual or auditory person-to-person -person communications where the person is subject to a direct personal encounter with te without time for reflection. So now we're narrowing in on the specific types of communication and then the comment goes on to say, such person-to-person -person contact does not include chat rooms, text messages, or other written communications that recipients may easily disregard. This was a pretty significant shift in that now this is the first indication that lawyers could reach out in real time to an individual and seek their, uh, you know, seek to have uh, a business relationship with that client. Um, there has been some ink spilled on whether actually text messages in particular are a medium in which people uh, feel not pressure, you know, that there's not that pressure relationship. I don't know, you know, I think everybody has a, a sort of different take on this, but the idea that text messaging is somehow impersonal or indirect um, is not a view that everyone shares. Um, I think as we go on in time, each new sort of communication type becomes disfavored for the new one. So where email was a big, you know, convenient way to communicate among uh, people for a long time, the younger generations are finding that email is even too much form, too formal, too much um, sort of uh, too much opportunity for spam and getting, you know, sort of junk mail and text is the prefer preferred form of personal private communication. So to allow texts from lawyers to potential clients with whom the uh, lawyer doesn't have a prior relationship could be argued to be more than just a sort of impersonal, uh, hands, uh, arm's length sort of interaction. But the, the model rules of professional conduct reflect this concern that lawyers were having that they couldn't really uh, communicate with people about offering their services um, with this, these real tight limitations and that electronic communication is becoming so common and so easy to ignore that perhaps it's actually not as problematic as other forms of communication. What I think is really interesting, and we can talk about this a little bit more later, is the last part of comment two kind of <coughs> explains the reason why there's concern for direct person-to-person -person contact. Um, and that is that there's a concern for a um, you know, pressure and uh, tactics that might make people feel like they don't have the room to make a decision on whom or whether to hire a lawyer. Um, so the person at the end here, it says the person who may already feel overwhelmed by the circumstances giving rise to the need for legal services may find it difficult to fully evaluate all available alternatives with reasoned judgment and appropriate self-interest in the face of the lawyer's presence and insistence upon an immediate response. The situation is fraught with the possibility of undue influence, intimidation, and overreaching. And that's a I think that's a valid concern, but we'll, we'll circle back on this um, in just a few minutes. Okay, Nebraska. This one is near and dear to your hearts, I, I assume. Um, this is the uh, sort of, I would say, a slightly updated version of the rule. It does include some carve out for certain types of live in-person or one-on-one -on -one, uh, uh, communication, but it's pretty limited as well, maybe more limited than the model rules. Um, so it, the, the admonition remains that a person shall not by in-person live telephone or real-time electronic contact solicit professional employment from a prospective client when a significant motive for the lawyers doing so is the lawyer's pecuniary gain unless. So general prohibition to seek paid work. But if the person contacted is, and it follows the exceptions in the model rules, a lawyer, a close family member, or close personal friend, family member, prior professional relationship, then the contact would be permissible. Um, 
Also, lawyers shall not solicit professional employment from a prospective client by written, recorded, or electronic communication. So the carve-out that would allow that in the prior, um, in the prior version um, is also prohibited if the prospective client has made known to a lawyer a desire not to be solicited or the solicitation involves coercion, duress, or harassment. So that's really, I think, getting at the core of the concern that in fact, what we're re really worried about here is that the general public will feel harangued by lawyers or feel that they can't get away from the solicitation for, uh, for clients, for uh, representation if they've been you know, hurt in a car accident or something that's publicly um, available information. And, um, and so the, the, the fix here is to specifically prohibit that. Right? If you don't, you know, if you tell people, tell lawyers, don't solicit people when they've told you not to, then it should be pretty clear that that is, um, that that is, you know, that's overreaching and that lawyers should not engage in that behavior. Okay, here's the more significant departure. The state of Washington, thanks to Steve Severson for alerting me to this. Um, in Washington state, the rules of professional conduct um, actually change the, the kind of flip the analysis on how to think about client solicitation. And the rule says a lawyer, a lawyer may solicit professional employment unless, right? So then the exceptions kick in um, and tell us when it's not appropriate to do so. But generally the rule is now in Washington, you can solicit one-on-one -on -one, uh, in-person live communication uh, clients. So if you're at an event where you're, you know, at an art gallery and drinking some wine and someone says, uh, you know, I have a, a problem and I don't know if I need a lawyer, you don't have to try really hard to avoid violating this rule. You could say, well, maybe I could help you. Um, unless the solicitation is false or misleading, the, the lawyer knows or reasonably should know that the physical, emotional, or mental state of the subject of the solicitation <coughs> is such that the person could not exercise reasonable judgment in employing a lawyer. The subject of the solicitation has made known to the lawyer a desire not to be solicited by the lawyer or the lawyer, or, excuse me, or the solicitation involves coercion, duress, or harassment. So that really allows a little more flexibility for lawyers to actually engage in solicitation. Um, it allows for potential clients to block that engagement if they are bothered by it, but it really moves the burden to the individual and the general public to assert their own uh, protection and say, I don't want you to talk to me about this, which is, as we understand in sort of practical, personal, inter interpersonal relationships may be difficult to do in some circumstances. Um, but the general presumption is that the initial outreach or the initial communication by the lawyer is okay as long as the lawyer has reason to believe that the client um, is not somehow vulnerable to that solicitation or to, to what may be perceived as an aggressive tactic. Catch up here on my notes. Okay, so this is really, I think, where the discussion is most important and interesting. So we have the history of really having a strong belief um, in the legal profession that allowing one-on-one -on -one live in-person communication is, is not good for, the, for anyone, really. Um, that it's not good for the public, it's not good for the legal community, and it's not good for business and state interests. Um, and so what we, but we, I think we should be asking what we mean when we say we're worried about those particular entities. So are we, um, you know, adhering to these rules in the places where we are in order, to, are we trying to protect the public from aggressive solicitation tactics and pressure? Are we protecting the reputation of the legal community? Are we, or are we protecting business or state uh, interests from litigation? And the answer is maybe all of those things. But the question is, are we actually doing that in the current forms of the rule? 
Um, and we see now this sort of like we're testing uh, certain states and Washington in particular is sort of testing the theory that perhaps we're not being, um, we're not getting at the protections that we intend. So if we think about protecting the public from aggressive solicitation tactics and pressure, um, we have to think about this going back to what I said at the beginning, which is this perception that there really isn't any protection for the public from aggressive um, solicitation tactics and pressure. The perception by the public is that lawyers are very aggressive in, in soliciting clients one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I don't know if that's just a sort of, you know, reality per versus perception, but if perception is more important than reality, which it really is, um, then that's what we need to deal with. So if people think that lawyers are being aggressive in their uh, solicitation tactics, then maybe the rules should reflect a concern for that and address that more directly. So a, a total ban or a very broad ban on communication, direct live, person-to-person uh, -person solicitation may not actually get at the core of the problem, which is that people feel like they are potentially going to be harassed by lawyers if, um, you know, if they're in a room with a lawyer and they need a lawyer, that all of a sudden they're just going to be descended upon. Um, and that's a perception that needs to be perhaps addressed or maybe it needs to be changed in other forms than the, the rule itself because the rules have been around and the perception still exists. The next is protect the reputation of the legal community. This idea of Sharswood that we are debasing ourselves and the reputation of the community if we are hunting around for clients in real time, that it's going to make people feel like we're not serious, that we don't actually care about their harms, and that we don't actually want to fix problems. All we're doing is trying to hunt out the next buck, right? That people aren't people, they're simply um, subjects of our employment uh, you know, uh, ambition. And that's problematic, obviously. We don't want that perception. Um, and, but again, the perception may already exist. To the extent that you hear you know, any negative uh, comments about lawyers being aggressive in their solicitation tactics, um, it appears the reputation has not been preserved by the rules in their current form. Um, and then the last is a little bit more, you know, kind of thinking, linking back into those Supreme Court cases in Oralic and in Ray Primus. In Oralic, the idea was to protect the individuals. That was a case where the lawyer uh, went to the hospital room of some 18-year-old uh, girls who had been injured in a car accident. He went to the home of one of the uh, girls and talked to her parents. Um, and uh, well, one was, I think, under 18, and the other was a young woman who was 18 or a little bit older. And the lawyer really did the thing that lawyers aren't supposed to do, which is, you know, kind of went straight in to, the, to their space while they were in a vulnerable place and asked to represent them. Um, that case, the court said the lawyer was just pushing uh, too hard, putting people in a tough position and an even more difficult one by making them uh, make a decision about their representation while they were in pain and unable to really make, um, you know, maybe medicated. It was not a great uh, set of facts for the lawyer. Um, but the potential problem there is that what the, the facts showed was that ultimately the lawyer not being able to represent the clients may have resulted in the insurance company that was involved in that case getting a better settlement that the, uh, the, the parties may have actually done better if they had had representation, maybe not that particular lawyer, but um, if they'd had representation, then they wouldn't have taken the offer from the insurance company so quickly. Despite that, the Supreme Court said the discipline was appropriate, uh, or at least was not a violation of the First Amendment. But looking on the other uh, side of this, in the case in Ray Primus, in that circumstance, this was a civil rights matter as I described, of serious import, the state would not necessarily have been checked on its power to, um, you know, to violate the civil rights of those individuals if 
they didn't know that lawyers were willing to represent them for free. So the fact that the ACLU attorneys were not disciplined or were, the Supreme Court said it was a violation of their First Amendment rights to discipline them for reaching out to offer pro bono legal representation um, would have, you know, if that decision had come out differently, then it's possible that there are bad actors out there and state governments or, or um, large business entities that may benefit from this uh, sort of block on one-on-one -on -one client communication, potential client solicitation. And so um, informing the public about their rights or their abilities to file litigation um, in circumstances where they've been harmed um, is another way of looking at what it means to reach out to the public and solicit uh, their to solicit their business. Yes, it is a profession in which we get paid despite Professor Dean Sharswood's concerns that this is a money-making industry. Um, this is part of what we do, but one of the benefits of the fact that we do get paid for doing this work is that there are a lot of us that are out there trying to help people assert their interests, both from the perspective of civil rights claims, but also for people who've been harmed um, perhaps by you know, consumer products or people who work for a company that has been on the wrong end of a contract breach and needs some help in getting that, um, getting those rights uh, defended. So, you know, I'm not sure that necessarily keeping people from uh, lawyers and people who can help them is always better for uh, the, the, the reputation of the legal community and the individuals who are represented by lawyers. So one of the things as I'm wrapping up here, I think that we need to think about is as a legal community in Nebraska, which of these, you know, we've kind of got the spectrum, Nebraska being a, a somewhat more restrictive jurisdiction when it comes to communications between lawyers and potential clients, the model rules of professional conduct starting to loosen the reins a little bit, and then Washington sort of saying, you know what, we're gonna try it. We're gonna see what happens. What what will, um, you know, maybe it will be better for the, the lawyers and the public if we just focus on what precisely we're actually, what we're concerned about going back to Washington, um, that there is still a potential for individuals to bring an action um, and, and say that this was overreaching, it was improper, um, that the disciplinary process is available um, when there's been coercion, duress, or harassment, um, false or misleading statements, et cetera, is, is this really what we care about? And if it is, maybe we should just say so. And that we allow the sort of, um, you know, the, the, the market of lawyers and, um, and potential clients to work through what we think is the best option uh, or what the best path for moving forward. Um, that said, you know, there, there is concern uh, that I think a lot of people who work in professional ethics uh, have, which is that sometimes self-policing organizations aren't the best at actually rooting out the bad behavior. Um, it shifts the responsibility to the public in many respects to seek discipline of lawyers who have, um, have violated the rules and that this, this Washington version makes it even harder to seek out um, information about that, those bad tactics. So my goal for today was just to have you uh, sort of think about which path is right for Nebraska. Um, is, it, is it a good idea to continue prohibiting direct solicitation? You certainly would be in the majority to do that. It's not common. Most states have not moved away from that. Um, but perhaps defining solicit direct solicitation uh, more broadly or more narrowly, depending on how um, we want to proceed or move to a model that just prohibits the harassing conduct, which is perhaps what we're most concerned about in the first place. So um, I'm happy to take questions or comments if we have, we have just a couple minutes left, I think, but um, thoughts are welcome. Yes, Professor Sievers. Nebraska, either through the Supreme Court or through the Nebraska State Bar, has 
has, has any discussion come up on this? I would actually probably ask the folks in the room if they're aware of any um, discussion on that. I'm not aware of any. I mean, it's these are fairly new. The, the, the ship doesn't turn very quickly. I mean, Washington seems to be pretty uh, progressive in this regard and, and reevaluating how the rules work there um, or how they should work. Uh, we may see in a few years that states are watching what Washington, uh, how it works out in Washington and the change may come then if it seems like it's, it's going okay. Um, I suspect it's more of an issue actually in larger, in states with larger bar membership where there's a more larger population where you've just got more people um, who need litigation uh, services. All right, thank you very much. You know, I'd like, like to make a brief announcement. If anybody's standing up in the back and you'd like to sit down, we've got plenty of chairs in the middle here, either side, uh, just so you don't have to stand for another hour or so if you want. If you want to stay where you're at, that's fine too. Before I introduce our next speakers, I wanted just to take a minute to, to note that we've had guest speakers as part of our format for the last 17 years, and we still haven't paid any guest appearance fees or any honorarium or, or anything like that, simply because our guest speakers have been so uh, great, gracious and willing to participate in these uh, functions. So that's true again here today. Um, I contacted Doug Richmond, who's the managing partner of Aon in Kansas City, and I said, uh, Doug, would you be interested in coming back to uh, uh, Creighton to uh, speak again? Because about seven or eight years ago, he was here, spoke at this uh, event, he did a great job. And he said, well, yeah, I, I've got a conflict. I can't come. Uh, I think he was addressing something at the ABA today. So that's why he can't be here today. But he said, I'm not going to send the first team. I'll send the better team. And the better team is Mark. Um, Matt Corbin and Mark Webster from, from Aon. They're going to be speaking on the understanding the law firm liability dream. Aon is an insurance broker that specializes in insurance malpractice and insurance coverage for lawyers. So without further ado, please welcome Matt and Mark. I've always thought it'd be fun to put a, a kind of an experiment, put a sign down here that says back of the room to see how many people would kind of kind of wander the front row. Let's see how it goes. Showing up? Perfect. All right. Well, thank you everyone for having us with you today uh, to present our program, Understanding the Law Firm Liability Terrain. Uh, my name is Mark Webster. With me, I have my colleague, Matt Corbin. Uh, we both work for Aon. We're in the Kansas City office. Uh, we're with the professional services practice, so we represent approximately 275 law firms and a population of about 76,000 lawyers with regard to their insurance broking needs. Matt and I are members of the loss prevention team, uh, which is made up of all former law firm partners. And we consult with our law firms and with their managing partners and general counsel, as well as all the lawyers in the firms, uh, about issues of pro professional responsibility, uh, ethics, and civil liability. So today we're here to talk with you about what we call the law firm liability uh, terrain. And the main way that we get our information um, for this program is from our data. Now, our, our deep dive into law firm data really began in earnest in about 2015 when we did our first 10-year study of claims against all of our uh, law firms that procure uh, lawyers professional liability insurance. And since then, we've updated that study on an annual basis. And from all the claims and the information we get, we're really able to slice and dice that information. And it really gives us a good picture of just what the issues are that are facing law firms, particularly with uh, regard to risk and professional liability. Uh, Matt, if we could jump to the next slide. This is our program agenda for today. So we've got five subtopics here. We're gonna start with section one, just a brief overview, again, of all those claims against our law firms since 2004. Uh, then Matt's gonna jump in in section two and talk about those claims by practice area. What are the practice areas we see uh, that cause us the most severe claims, uh, that have the most frequent notices and claims, and what other data can we glean uh, from that particular area? I'm gonna jump back in in section three and talk about claims by cause of loss. So this is the action, or at least the alleged action, 
uh, done by lawyers and law firms and sometimes law firms' clients uh, that cause the losses uh, that we see. In section four, we're gonna talk about claim trends, so we'll get into some real life examples uh, of the sorts of issues we see uh, that come out of these claims. And then we're gonna close in section five with just some risk management advice based on these claims that we look at and also based on our conversations with our firms, uh, general counsel, managing partners, and, and practice group leaders. So Matt, if we could jump to the next slide. Now we're gonna go into section one with just a brief overview of our claims from 2004 to 2021. I should note the date range. It only goes through 2021 because we have to wait until all of the year's data is included uh, before we add the next round of data. We did just complete 2022, uh, but we weren't able to get it approved by the Aon higher ups to slide into to these slides. So this is close to the most recent data that we've got, but I should still give a good picture. So Matt, if we could jump to the next slide. Uh, we've got a few pieces of data here to look at. The first one in the upper left corner, you see this is the number of notifications that all of our firms have received uh, since 2004, 11,467. And when we talk about notifications, those are basically our claims. That could either be a circumstance, uh, which is reported by a firm or a lawyer, the type of issues that could lead to a claim, or claims themselves, which could be uh, a demand, uh, demand letter or a lawsuit or maybe a request for a tolling agreement. Then if you go to the box below that, um, you see that we have 1,816 settlements or judgments paid. So of those 11,500 approximately notifications, 1,800 of them have resulted uh, in some sort of payment. And then we get the dollars uh, in the next column there. So approximately $4.4 billion in total indemnity payments uh, made among all of our law firms. And when we talk about payments, we take those numbers ground up. So that's from the first dollar paid, whether that's from the firm, out of its own pocket, out of its self-insured retention, or by their insurer. Uh, then the next number down, you see defense costs, whether or not a payment is ever made or it ever goes to judgment, there's almost always some level of defense costs associated with these issues uh, when a claim is made against a law firm. We know that number is too low because of the way that we collect this data. Uh, we know there's just a lot of defense costs that firms handle on their own that they don't report, uh, but we still think uh, that it's probably the best data available in the industry and it's at least close to what the actual uh, cost is. And so you can see the total we have there is about $6.3 billion in ground up payments since 2004. Uh, on the next slide, this is just a chart that we regularly update annually. And there's just three things to briefly note on this slide. If you look at the light gray, light bluish bar, that's the total number of claims that we receive on an annual basis. It stayed fairly consistent, although it's dropped over the last couple of years. And I think Matt's going to talk about that later on in the program. Then when you see the bright blue bar, that's the number of open notifications. So those claims that have been made that have not either been dismissed or had a settlement or, or gone to judgment, uh, it has a stair step pattern, which is what you'd expect. The farther back you go, the fewer open claims. Those claims you see that are open from prior to 2014 or 2013 are not a welcome sight. Claims do not age particularly well. Um, so those are usually thornier issues that, that we fear may end in a in larger claims. And then when we look at the red line, that's the total number of ground up payments attributable to each year. Uh, we take these by policy year, just like insurers do. So if a claim is made in 2008, it doesn't settle until 2012, the dollars go into the 2008 bucket. So as you can see, 2008 and nine were particularly cruel uh, to law firms and insurers. A lot of that is attributable to the economic downturn and crisis that happened during those years. You'll see the red line uh, is low. It's very small in recent years, but recall uh, that a number of claims are still open. You see the blue bar uh, is high. So once those claims start to settle or go to judgment, you'll see that red line pick right up. Uh, if we could jump to the next slide, this is just another way to look at it. I'll keep this brief. While we track these by policy year, the dollars are obviously paid out by the firms or by their insurers in a calendar year. It was extremely steady from 2011 through about 2017, but then we saw a massive jump in 2019 and 2020. Based on our study, that's primarily attributable uh, just to some massive claims that we saw settle uh, during those years. And we'll talk about a few of those later on. Uh, they were primarily in the securities and, and corporate areas. But when you have a few 50 to $100 million claims settling against law firms, uh, it tends to push those numbers up. We saw a huge drop in 2021, and we're seeing the same in 2022. We don't have an exact reason uh, for why that's happened, other than we know as I mentioned, that a number of those big claims have settled. We have a few more still percolating, so, so those numbers could change in the near future. But with that, Matt, I think I'm over to you. We reviewed the notifications that we received from our law firms, and then we're able to then assign those to one of 21 different practice areas. And using those, we can then kind of look for trends, uh, both in terms of claim frequency and claim severity uh, by practice area. This skeletal chart shows you 
claim frequency by practice area, historically, commercial litigation, and corporate and transactional practice have led the way, and that's what our data uh, continues to show. Real estate, trust, estates, and IP uh, are in that 8% to 11% range. We've seen more of a bump uh, lately in the real estate by frequency, a little bit of a decrease on the IP claims. Uh, you can see the other bucket, that's actually 15 practice areas uh, combined together. You'll see some of them listed here on the next few slides, but banking, administrative law, uh, family law, securities. Uh, one of our nearest competitors, or our big competitor really, is the Attorney's Liability Assurance Society, better known as ALAS. Uh, ALAS also has a similar stable of a large mid-sized law firms and boutique <coughs> firms, and they're chart on claim frequency by practice area looks quite similar to ours. Now, the American Bar Association has its own study called the Profile of Legal Malpractice Claims. Their study focuses almost exclusively on small law firms and solo practitioners with 10 lawyers or less. Uh, their claim frequency chart looks, looks much different. Uh, plaintiff personal injury litigation, family law, bankruptcy and collection, real estate, and trust in states would be their top five practice areas. So claim frequency by practice area really is dependent in many respects on the firm population. Now this chart shows you claim frequency, excuse me, claim severity uh, by practice area. So if you, you look at it and you study for a while, you'll notice a really large bar over there. And we've taken a look at it and we've come to the conclusion uh, that only corporate and transactional lawyers are capable of crushingly destructive behavior. <laughs> if anybody's going to bring their firm down, it's going to be one of your corporate transactional lawyers. Uh, the rest of you have to be content uh, with being disbarred or, or indicted. So, uh, here, here's your takeaway for today. Uh, securities didn't show up at all our claim frequency on the slide before. Uh, also very big uh, on the severity side uh, with trust estates and commercial litigation real estate also having pretty big on co ground up pay. The one that we saw on the prior slide that doesn't have a big bar here would be the labor and employment claims. That's kind of a, a high frequency, but, but lower severity. So on the corporate transaction, why is it so big? What was some of the problems that we see? Well, one is it's the size of the deals. It's just the, the million dollar, billion dollar deals are becoming more and more commonplace. Uh, another issue is mistakes. If a corporate transactional lawyer makes a mistake, it really is difficult once those deal documents uh, get out the front door, you know, they're tested years later, and if there's a mistake, well, there's not much you can do about it at that point, and that's where a lot of the dollars, uh, unfortunately, come from. Also, uh, corporate transactional lawyers find themselves as the targets uh, by third-party claims, and those are often under a broader misrepresentation theory, uh, as well as an aiding and abetting theory. So those are some of the kind of the reasons we see why the corporate and transactional lawyers find themselves in that predicament. This shows you average uh, pay per claim. Uh, securities, again, we just had a number of securities claims in recent years uh, that have really spiked uh, the average. There are a couple of outliers you can see on this slide. Uh, one uh, would be the uh, energy. So just a couple of energy claims we've had. Not a lot, so a couple we've had have really been, been big ones. Um, government affairs are lobbying. Uh, unless your firm employs Jack Abramoff, I assure you, you have nothing to worry about. All those claims are, are because of that particular uh, lobbyist. Uh, if we look at, at our media, we didn't bring all of our slides. That would be quite too much for you. But the, the median uh, is sometimes a better indicator of some of the dollars that we see. Even the big number on securities, the median payment is only $700,000. Only $700,000. Uh, also, the uh, corporate transaction there at the end is about $300,000. So about six figures, and that's still real money for law firms, obviously. I think all that money usually comes out of a firm's pocketbook, a uh, part of their self-insured retention. Those are dollars that you'd rather have to be spent on improving or growing your law firm, you know, whether that's I compensation, uh, IT, uh, or, or security system. Yeah, next we're going to talk about the cause of loss. So what are the actions or alleged actions uh, that are causing these sorts of claims uh, that we see. So if we could jump to the next slide, and I promise it's not all data. Once we get through section three, then we'll get into some real world examples as well. 
But since the uh, initial study, by far, the issue that has led the way in terms of losses is attorney mistakes. And these really run the gamut. They can be attorney negligence, improper advice, drafting issues, uh, cutting and pasting issues, missed deadlines. The list really goes on. And in fact, it's on the rise in just the last six years, 60% of every claim that we see uh, in terms of notices, at least, is based on attorney mistakes. In second place there, you have what we categorize as fraud and misrepresentation. Uh, this typically involves a fraudulent misrepresentation to a third party. So for instance, in the transactional context, uh, this would present as a misrepresentation maybe in a contract with representations and warranties, or perhaps in an opinion letter uh, or an offering statement. Uh, after that, we have dishonest clients, which is only 10% of all notices we see, but those are extremely severe and expensive claims. And we're going to talk about that a couple more times uh, throughout this presentation. Then next at 8%, we have conflicts of interest. Now, while it's only 8% of notices, it's a huge issue, at least as far as our firms are concerned. In fact, when we, uh, we do a lot of surveys of our firms and their general counsel. And when we asked them a couple of years ago, what are the top five issues that keep you up at night? Conflicts came in at number one, and it continues to do so uh, each year. I think because it's ubiquitous, it can be complicated. And they mentioned that it really injects heat or problems into a regular vanilla malpractice claim. So if there's a claim uh, that a mistake was made, but if a, a plaintiff's lawyer can say, yeah, a mistake was made, but that was because you favored one client over another and add a conflict in there, it can really increase the cost and the problems uh, of those sorts of claims. Uh, if we could go to the next slide, this shows you the total ground up payments based on conduct causing the loss. So it's no surprise since it's over half of all the claims we see mistakes are by far the largest in terms of total ground up payments at over $3 billion total. Second place there, you see dishonest clients. Now recall that was only 10% of every claim that's made, but it's the second place in terms of total uh, dollars paid. Those are extremely expensive claims. And we're gonna get into some specifics and how to avoid those sorts of clients uh, later on in the presentation. Fraud and misrepresentation comes in at a close third. Uh, one issue I wanna point out is impaired lawyer. That's an extremely small dollar amount, but this is not to suggest that impaired lawyers are not a problem. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Uh, there's a lot of studies out there, a lot of presentations on how lawyer impairment is arguably on the rise, and it's certainly a problem uh, throughout the profession. The issue uh, for us, is it's simply not reported in the types of ways that we can collect uh, for data. A lot of law firms simply don't want to mention it out of respect for the privacy of the impaired lawyer, or sometimes they just think it's not a good idea if they're going to report a mistake or a circumstance. Uh, they don't see any benefit in explaining that it was because the lawyer was impaired. So we know it's a serious problem, so we keep it on there, but it just doesn't really reflect in the data. Uh, if we could jump to the next slide, this is just the average ground up payment based on cause of loss. So as you can see, this is where dishonest clients really shows up. So for every claim that's made that has any payment, the average payout is $4.4 million for a dishonest client claim. So it more than doubles the next closest uh, at fraud and misrepresentation. And after that, we see conflicts of interest uh, is also quite expensive. So uh, Matt, with that, I think I'm going to turn it back over to you for some claim trends. This is our dishonesty pay slide, I think. <laughs> um, so to give you a much needed break from all the uh, color, colorful uh, graphs and charts, we thought we'd just for a minute drill down a little further on some of our more major practice areas and at least give you a, a snapshot of some of the trends we, we see. Uh, but first, one more slide of uh, colorful charts and graphs, I promise. Okay. This is kind of our own version of the Casey case of American Top 40. Uh, these are the 40 biggest uh, claims we have at Aon or had at Aon, uh, they all exceed $30 million. Uh, if you look at the statistics over there, it's kind of echoing what we've already told you before. Uh, over half, or roughly half, come from the corporate transactional practice and the securities practice areas. And if you look at the cost of loss over here, about half come from uh, the states, and, and one in five come from uh, dishonest clients. Uh, we're always asked about, you know, what was kind of the common thread you see uh, for the most severe claims against law firms? You know, again, the size of the deals, the manner size of the deals is a huge part of that equation, at least with the corporate and, and securities world. I do think that the plaintiff's bar is becoming more and more sophisticated <coughs> and doing a great job at shifting away at some of the traditional uh, causation uh, uh, elements that you see in a legal malpractice claim. Uh, there's skyrocketing uh, defense costs you see on some of the biggest claims with billable hours, you know, exceeding $1,000 uh, last time I checked. A couple of these claims 
is what I probably call um, due to what enterprise failure is kind of a term that's been coined. If you represented a client that's on the brink of insolvency, uh, and then maybe after that representation, the client files for bankruptcy, a trustee's put in place, and then they turn around and they target all that company's uh, professionals, including uh, the lawyers, which are of course always uh, one of the last last man standing type, type deals. But on the whole, I would tell you that the mistakes and the issues that you see on the smallest claims, uh, you see also on on the large big scale claims that make this particular slide. So we've had one that's coming out of our real estate practice area where a lawyer failed to include just a standard provision in a real estate agreement and it triggered millions of dollars in capital gains tax liabilities. There's a litigation claim on this slide uh, where the, the firm was defending a client and a jury verdict was reached uh, in the nine figures. And then it became kind of a 2020 hindsight Monday morning, money, excuse me, Monday morning quarterback exercise where they were looking at the, the jury instructions and the verdict forms uh, to pick those apart. And then that claim finally settled in excess of $30 million. Uh, there's one in the corporate transactional practice area uh, where two sides are working on a merger agreement. And the, the agreement provided that if the merger wasn't consummated by a certain date, uh, then, some, then one side had to file a motion or have motion out of notice to extend the time to continue those negotiations. Well, the deadline came at midnight, and that notice wasn't filed, but five seconds later, the other side filed a termination notice, which then entitled their client uh, to a nine-figure nine termination fee. So just a simple missed deadline. Uh, last one I'll mention is in the trust and estate practice area, where a law firm served as a trustee uh, for a billion-dollar trust. Uh, they mismanaged and squandered assets. There was a conflict of interest allegation in that one as well, where they were uh, putting uh, money or investing money into companies that they had a, a personal interest in uh, as well. And so when the value of this billion dollar trust goes down, uh, it, it caused a huge, huge claim uh, in the fallout. So with that, Mark, I'll send it to you for the corporate corporate area. Yeah, now we're going to break down our top six practice areas in terms of the types of claims that we see on a recurring basis. We won't spend too much time on, it, on many of these. In particular, we want to keep everyone uh, on schedule today. But in terms of corporate and transaction, we see a few recurring types of issues come up that aren't necessarily particularly different from other practice areas, but they're ones that just always seem uh, to occur when we get our new claims each year. First one we see in many practice areas is blaming lawyers for business misjudgments. We have so many instances in which it's the client that makes a misjudgment, but they don't want to blame themselves. They're looking for someone to blame, and oftentimes uh, they find the lawyer. I can think of one instance in which a firm represented a client in a dispute. Uh, eventually, that dispute moved into some law in a different state, so the firm said, we can't handle this. Here's the firm we recommend. Uh, you need to get their advice on this particular other state. The first firm thought they were done. A year later, uh, they're hit with a suit for malpractice because of advice that wasn't given on that particular state. So even though the firm did its diligence, it explained what the client needed to do, the client screwed up on its own, still came back and blamed the firm. Uh, we see scope of representation issues there. That's a major issue, but I'm not gonna steal Matt's thunder because I think he's going to talk about it later. I will say the engagement letter is typically the best way to handle that uh, up front, and it does create a number of issues in the corporate and in other practice areas. And we've got docketing and calendaring errors as well as drafting errors. These all fall into the realm of mistakes but we see so much money being spent just by failure to docket and calendar. As Matt already mentioned, missing deadlines just by a day or less uh, can cost a lot of money to firms and lawyers. And then we see closely held corporate clients. I think a lot of people, when they think of, of major claims, they think of Enrons or, or huge clients, but a lot of the issues we see are with closely held clients. And I think one of the reasons is because they're so difficult uh, with regard to conflicts. I think the lines often get blurred between the constituents, between the shareholders, and the entity themselves. And if lawyers do nothing to dissuade uh, the clients or the constituents of this, sometimes there's an issue where they think the lawyer represents them instead of the entity, and it can lead to claims. Uh, Matt, over to you. So in commercial litigation, you know, a host of, of mistakes and errors is might for missing statute limitations, uh, appellate appeals deadline, uh, maybe not uh, telling the client to institute a litigation hold, uh, missed expert disclosure deadlines, um, blaming lawyers for litigation misfortune. I've all already kind of given you a, a big example of that. But the allegations we commonly see, uh, you know, 
So as I mentioned, model rule, model 1.4, deal with communication breakdowns. Um, and a lot of times we see clients complain uh, that their lawyers oversold their chances at trial, uh, maybe they under-budgeted uh, the cost of litigation, or then communication breakdowns, even with uh, you know, sending recommendations or, or sending settlement offers to the other side. Uh, on the conflicts of interest, it's usually the joint uh, representation that uh, cause our firms uh, the most trouble. So, you know, if you're going to contemplate a joint representation, you know, sitting down, making sure that's something you want to do, that the interests uh, of both parties are aligned. A lot of times we see this being an issue with wanting to represent both the organization and an employee of the organization, and then their interests aren't quite aligned because the employee may have, may have done something that uh, wouldn't put them on the same uh, same interest level as the organization. At, a lot of times we've seen some of the claims on, on the conflict of interest front here on a failure by a lawyer to get informed consent to a conflict of interest. Again, so having that meaningful conversation about you know, the material risks of that proposed joint representation and what the other alternatives are. I was at a conference a couple of weeks ago and, and Peter Jarvis, one of the, uh, one of the big uh, leaders in this space, was talking about uh, the definition of materiality in relation to informed consent. And he said, the definition of materiality is when the lawyer says, I can't put that in there because the client won't sign it. If that's the response, then it's probably material. Uh, there was another um, kind of expert in this space to say, told me, to truly get informed consent, you have to try to convince your client not to hire you. And if you fail, then you truly achieve informed consent. Now, that's a great theory and all, but not a great business model. Uh, if your, your children are accustomed to wearing shoes and looking at doors, uh, that's probably not one that, that I would use. But at the same time, it does bring, bring true that having those meaningful conversations with clients and then at least documenting those in a reasonably detailed writing uh, is a great way to make sure that you have the informed consent locked down if, it, if it's later uh, tested. Mark? Yeah, moving on to real estate, uh, the first one we see there on the top left has been a hot topic as of late, and it's it's arguably becoming uh, more dangerous for firms. This is wire transfer fraud, and this gets into the whole realm of cybersecurity, ransomware, and all these issues that we continue to see and continue to get asked about. Wire transfer fraud uh, typically occurs where a real estate transaction is about to close. A fraudster somehow finds out about it, and they're able typically to spoof an email either of a title company uh, or of a bank. They switch the routing numbers uh, in that email, and when the wire happens at the closing, the money goes into the fraudster's account. By the time anyone figures out what has happened, the money is long gone. Clients, of course, are typically upset about this, and oftentimes they blame lawyers, and sometimes the lawyers are on the hook for it. It really depends on the court, but certain courts have said whoever has the last best opportunity or chance to figure out this fraud uh, is sometimes responsible, and a lot of times they take into account the sophistication of the lawyer or the client uh, in those cases. You know, these cyber issues are getting, again, uh, more painful. We, we recently saw a ransomware negotiator and we spoke with him and he said, it's no longer just someone in their mom's basement, you know, handling these issues. These in many cases are almost like corporations that are running these sorts of scams. They have, he said, they have HR departments, they have holidays. He said, if you're going to pay a ransom, if you're a law firm that's been hit with ransomware, it's best to pay it on a Friday afternoon because they want to get to their weekend and they'll probably give you a better deal. So it's uh, it's becoming a, a more serious issue and ones that our firms are very concerned about. Uh, but then, you know, moving over, we've got alleged bad substantive advice. I think we could mention this uh, in any practice area. One that we recently ran into in real estate uh, was just a lawyer accidentally giving the incorrect advice on the voting requirement that it would take, what percentage to subdivide some lots. Uh, based on that advice, they thought the vote passed. The lots were subdivided. A developer began building on all of them until they figured out that actually the vote uh, was not adequate. So, of course, the client was upset, experienced some losses. They sued the lawyer, and the lawyer had to pay. Um, we talked about drafting errors a little bit, but the last thing I'll note is just deceptive conduct. You know, in real estate, we've really seen a lot of dishonesty, a lot of misrepresentations and deceptive conduct, whether it's forged documents, staged real estate closings, misappropriated funds or, or falsified disclosures. This is an issue that for some reason really picks up in the real estate realm. Matt? So IP, the main story in IP is over 80% of the notifications we received, it's an alleged mistake. You know, it's a misapplication deadline. 
Uh, there's a mistake in the process, maybe the wrong file uh, form has been filed. Uh, a mistyped email address, we've seen that one. Uh, filing in Ghana instead of Guinea. Filing in, in Thailand instead of Taiwan. These are actual, actual claims that we've seen. So it's a very mistake driven practice area as far as the claims. Uh, we also see scope of representation issues here. Uh, who's responsible for handling any maintenance fees? Is it the client? Is it the lawyer? Is it maybe another lawyer? And, or is some third party handling the maintenance fees? And if those things are addressed and the, the ambiguity or gray area on the allocation responsibilities, uh, we've seen claims. Uh, the bottom line, that's uh, one that we've kind of seen pop up, the alleged misuse of confidential information. Uh, one of the more recent claims is that the lawyer and client claim interest in a third party's IP in order to gather their technical information and data, and then that lawyer and client turn around and file a patent uh, on that information. I don't think that claim has a lot of merit, but it's going to cost a lot to defend, which I think is one of the underlying things you've got to remember from a presentation like this, just even America's claims uh, that we see uh, do take a lot of uh, time and resources uh, for lawyers to yeah, next we have securities. We won't spend too much time here. Uh, you see Charles Ponzi picture there, who's perhaps the founding father of dishonest clients. But uh, the action in securities is really on the dishonesty side. And I should note, while securities only account for about 6% of all of our claims, uh, they're by far the most expensive at more than $10 million per paid claim. So they can be uh, a serious problem. But again, the action is on the dishonesty, uh, the Ponzi schemes, the fraud, those sorts of issues. We also see some issues with concurrent conflicts of interest, particularly when the client entity uh, is represented as well as someone in whom they invest or someone who invests in them uh, that can see folks get sideways from a conflicts uh, issue. And then we also see mistakes, which are more uh, expensive in securities than they are in any other practice area. Typically, it's with something like inadequate due diligence or just the wrong advice when it comes to a securities transaction uh, that can really create the problems. Uh, Matt? We just want to give all oh, our trust mistakes. Uh, on this one, it's mostly mistakes and conflicts of interest, uh, conflicts between husbands and wives, uh, conflicts between family members. Um, the client communication problems, a lot of times the allegation we see it is the communication wasn't delivered uh, to the non money spouse or the non decision making spouse. I know some firms are now putting language in their engagement agreement saying if we've given a communication to uh, one spouse, then we are entitled to assume that. Uh, the other spouse uh, received it. Uh, we've also seen, as I mentioned, problems with lawyers uh, serving as trustee, mismanaging funds, squandering assets. Uh, sometimes communications aren't or information not delivered to the beneficiaries. Uh, sometimes conflicts if the firm also represents the beneficiary in another matter and the lawyer is making some type of distribution to one beneficiary that is the client on another matter as opposed to the other beneficiary. Uh, advice on the laws of another state, uh, there's a few claims where a lawyer is advised for a client that is off to move to Florida, advising on, on the Florida laws, on property laws, and then hasn't done enough uh, research on that to be competent uh, under 1.1 to provide that advice and then gets in trouble. There's a, there's a UPL 5.5 issue lurking in there as well if you had enough clients in Florida, but that's another program for, for another day. Inadequate due diligence. Uh, you know, that's sometimes the trust in case lawyers get in trouble. If they just haven't done enough digging into a prior settlement agreement, uh, financial obligations, prior children, and a prior marriage, and unfortunately, we've seen some lawyers uh, face claims because of that type of inadequate due diligence claim. We wanted to quickly just touch on, we sometimes get questions about, well, what have you seen uh, in, in a pandemic? Because I can tell you in, in April and May of 2020, uh, we were listening and reading a lot about all the dire consequences that were about to uh, befall us in terms of the claims experience uh, because uh, of COVID and the pandemic. And that it was, I think one expert said it was going to make the economic downturn from 2007 to 2008 look like a picnic in the park. Um, I mean, fortunately, that, that hasn't uh, been true, at least in our, our claim experience with Aon. We really haven't seen. Uh, very few claims that are directly attributable to the pandemic and COVID. There have been a couple of PPP loan transaction claims, some missed deadlines that you could at least uh, point towards uh, a court closure or, or a COVID 
uh, rule and, and a date was miscalculated. But overall, uh, our notifications during 2020 and 2021 have been down. I know a lot of people in the market say still have a frequency of severity, so we're still seeing enough of the bigger claims. But the problem with a lot of the malpractice claims is uh, they have a long tail on. Most claims in, in the malpractice uh, space don't settle for five or seven years on average after a notice or an notification has been filed. So the true story for you know what are the severe claims that we've seen during this time period, but we actually aren't going to probably go for a couple of more more years. Yeah, with that we thought uh, you know we'd give you a, a break on, on kind of the scared straight portion of the program and the parade of horribles uh, with all the claims and talk a little bit about some kind of the fundamental risk standard advice, uh, kind of resensitizing some of the concepts that are, are certainly are consistent with practicing responsibly and ethically, whether it's competency or, or diligence or communication, avoiding conflicts of interest uh, or supervision as lawyers. Uh, we've always told, told our firm clients uh, that we can cut their risk by at least half if they would just get rid of all their clients. <laughs> Nobody's taken us up on that one yet, so this is kind of like our plan B, uh, where we're going to talk at least, uh, at least on the dishonest clients, because we've seen all the kind of severe, severe claims that have come out of the dishonest client category, as well as mistakes, just because of the sheer volume of mistake claims uh, that we see. But we're going to begin with the dishonest client, because uh, I think good risk management starts with good client intake. We all want to bring business in the door, but it really is. Uh, important not to cut corners here. And this has been a really hot issue, and it's going to remain a hot issue uh, with, with client due diligence. Uh, I know that uh, right now there's been a lot of talk about uh, money laundering and financing of terrorism and, and Congress wanting to regulate uh, our profession, uh, particularly with respect to client due diligence issues. The ABA is working really hard on this uh, right now. If you look at Model 1.2D, it talks about the prohibition on counseling or advising clients uh, on conduct you know to be fraudulent or criminal, but the ABA has been working to they add 1.2D. They actually tried that first and they moved on to looking at 1.16, which is uh, the withdrawal uh, rule under the rules and trying to provide some language in there on, on a client due diligence standard or providing a, some language on doing a risk assessment or even a, a mandatory withdrawal if the client's using your services to commit a fraud uh, on, on another party. So that's kind of the story that we're seeing play out for now. We like to talk to our clients a lot about kind of what are the, the warning signs or red flags uh, that might signal a dishonest or an unworthy client. And so we kind of always pull bullet points from claims uh, that we see over the years. So on this slide and on the next slide, we, we've listed some of these factors. Now, admittedly, I mean, all of these if you have one of these present in a representation, don't go say, well, Matt Mark told us that we're now representing a dishonest client. That's not, not the takeaway we're here. These can be perfectly legitimate, but they can also, from time to time, uh, may signal that you might want to at least put your antenna up. I mean, certainly, we all have represented private entities, but we have far less concern with, with publicly traded companies, publicly held companies, where there's more regulatory scrutiny, uh, more checks and balances, uh, maybe a client that comes to you with an incomprehensible business plan, maybe it seems too good to be true, maybe it's beyond their expertise or, or beyond the resources, maybe it relies a whole lot on third party money, because those are the third parties that we see that ultimately become uh, the plaintiffs that sue the corporate transactional um, lawyer later down the line. Uh, some of these other ones, uh, a lot of times they want you to make representations on their behalf as to whether they're they're worthy or, or credible. Uh, you might see some of these unworthy clients, they, they don't pay anybody. They don't do that, you can probably have an expectation that they're not going to pay you as well. I think really there is a fine line uh, between a, a client asking you to be aggressive and push the envelope in an honest way versus them trying to dupe, dupe one all over you and, and use your services to commit fraud. So this is this is admittedly a hard, hard challenge, but I think we have now more than they never open our eyes. And you also have to, I think, stay sensitive to changes you see uh, in clients over time. You have a client that's uh, ignoring your advice, won't follow your advice. I think that's a pretty big uh, red flag. A uh, client that won't share information with you. I know that in my practicing days, I would sit those clients down at the beginning and say, 
You have to tell me everything, no matter how bad it is. I can deal with it. Now, of course, I was lying. <laughs> There's some things that are so bad that you can't save your client. You actually you have to try to get everything and it's a challenge. Uh, another kind of factor that I, I've been kind of seeing more closely lately is clients that have kind of an abusive demeanor with their lawyers. I think that's a pretty good litmus test. If all of a sudden becoming abusive towards you in the representation, you know, draft it my way, or I'm going to go find another lawyer uh, to do it. You know, that's another one you've got to hit the pause button and say, what's really going on here? Uh, why is the client uh, acting that way? Uh, the one at the bottom, uh, stop paying your bills. Uh, we kind of have all these those no pay or slow pay client. Uh, these are the clients that kind of get their talents or hooks into you and make you do something that you would not otherwise do because of your hopes of trying to get paid. So it's a client manipulation strategy. You know, I got to close this deal. Uh, just so that I can finally get paid on it, then you end up uh, doing something that crosses the line. That was never an issue at our firm, uh, because as soon as there was a no pay or so pay uh, client issue, lab, the inhaler would, would show up at our doorstep, and that would be kind of the, the end of the story on the client a no pay issue. Um, here's a couple of more, uh, just kind of, kind of wrap this one up. Again, I think you're entitled to assume that your clients are behaving within the bounds of, of the law. Uh, there are times, though, that I think you have to go, hey, wait a minute here, and investigate more. Uh, if you originally suspect that you know, the client is up to no good or something doesn't seem right, it's a very good point to say, stop, get some help, let me talk to somebody else, let me look into this uh, further and figure it out. Um, as Mark has already mentioned, uh, the, invest the engagement uh, agreement is your best tool at your disposal, uh, so please use that, even if it's a a, an existing client is a new matter for me, so I have to have client identity, scope, uh, as well as your pay, pay and payment terms. Mark? Yeah, thanks. I think we've got about four minutes left and four slides, so I apologize for the speed with which we'll roll through these, but here we've got conflicts of interest. I already mentioned it's the number one issue, at least according to the GCs that we talk to. It's a constant problem. Here are just a few recurring issues that we see, and I think a lot of them are probably common sense. The first being initial conflict check errors, not getting all the information uh, you need up front about the client, about potential adversaries. It's a garbage in, garbage out scenario. Uh, then we've got the lack of conflicts checks midstream. A lot of times new parties are added after the initial check, after a client's brought in, or parties surface during the, uh, during the middle of a transaction or a litigation. We also see situations in which uh, a lawyer represents a client. The client wants help in a different practice area. So the lawyer introduces that client to one of their partners, uh, but both sides forget to run the conflicts check and they move forward and then issues come up uh, down the road. And then I'll just mention uh, on the bottom right, we, we have to ask if the conflict is waivable. And there's, there's two types of conflicts, really. You've got direct adversity, which is typically opposite sides of the V, landlord, tenant. Those are pretty difficult to waive. And then you've got material limitation conflict, whether your representation of one client or your personal interest will materially limit your ability to represent someone else. In many cases, those can be waived. You have to get informed consent. So you have to ask the question set forth there. Can you seek the consent? In many cases, yes. Should you? Well, that's gonna be more subjective and depend on the situation. Uh, moving to the next slide, these next two are just about mistakes. As we mentioned, 56% of all of our claims are based on mistakes. Uh, if these were easy to avoid, then they wouldn't take up 56% of all of our claims. So it's more of a risk uh, management, not really risk elimination, but based on our discussions with firms and lawyers, they've, they've come up with some ideas that they've shared with us for how they help try to avoid mistakes. And this whole page is about accepting and encouraging accountability. Don't shoot the messenger. The old TSA motto, if you see something, say something. There have been many cases where someone has noticed a mistake, but maybe it's an associate, someone that was too nervous to bring it up or mention it because of potentially the culture in the firm, or they just thought they shouldn't say anything. And that's allowed those mistakes to grow and become worse uh, over time. And then remember that you enjoy the intra-firm attorney-client privilege. So if you see an issue, you can talk to someone within your firm, although we would recommend typically doing this on the phone or in person. Uh, as we say, the E in email stands for exhibit. And unfortunately, we've seen that play out a number of times. Uh, one of our favorites was a client who, discovering his errors, quickly emailed his partner and said, I've, uh, I've committed malpractice bigger than Dallas, which was not good uh, when, they, when that was read later. So if we could jump to the next slide, uh, these are just a couple of other ideas of how to minimize the likelihood uh, of mistakes. Matt mentioned scope of representation. 
Active supervision is a good one. It's required under the ethics rules, model rules 5.1 and 5.3. It doesn't necessarily matter what your title is or within the firm. It's just over those whom you have supervisory responsibilities. You need to make efforts uh, to make sure that everyone's reasonably complying uh, with the model rules, and this helps avoid mistakes and malpractice claims as well. And then we'll know clarity and communication required by model rule 1.4. So many of the claims we see are based on just a failure to communicate, not keeping the client apprised of what it is that you're doing uh, and how the matter is going. And then they're surprised either by something that happens or more often by the bill uh, at the end. And that leads to a fee dispute. The final thing I'll note at the bottom is documenting client communications. We see this all the time. Uh, this is where, again, a client makes a business misjudgment. They either don't want to take the blame or they just can't understand how they could have made this mistake. So their natural inclination is to blame the lawyer. We talk to the lawyer and they say, I gave them the exact advice. They're saying that I didn't. I told them what to do and they ignored me. The problem is there is nothing written down. There's no memo to the file. There's no email to a fellow partner. Uh, so there's nothing that they can grab onto and it becomes a swearing match uh, between the two parties. So documenting important communications can be key. Last slide to you, Matt. This is an entire program in and of itself. It's a big issue, I think, since 2016 when the ABA has begun to put that big study. There's a more heightened awareness after the pandemic. Uh, you know, we're not a self help seeking profession. I think we all are kind of on ourselves, kind of our brothers and sisters, keepers. Stay connected. Uh, we can't ask to be healthcare professionals, but keep your eye, eyes open. Patrick Trail, who's one of the leaders in the space, you know, says read the map, look for changes in mood or appearance or performance uh, over time. Uh, but if you get a, a report of suspected impairment, you know, as part of your supervisory duties that are 5.1, uh, if you need to make a, a report to the state lawyer assistance program. But I do stay connected. This is a big front burner issue uh, for us. I think it'll be a, a priority because it's not only the right thing to do, but uh, I think it's an issue for, for our profession. Uh, with that, it's always our goal to stop talking before you stop listening. Uh, hopefully we've achieved that. We really appreciate your time today. We'll stick around if anybody has any questions, but uh, thank you very much. Um, and one final thing, usually you're, you've seen me do videos and include videos in my presentation, and I tried to do that this year. I, I looked around and scoured the internet for several months trying to find the appropriate thing, but there just wasn't anything new or refreshing out there. So you're gonna get stuck with kind of the black hole letter law. Uh, hopefully it will inform and it may just entertain as well but we will see but we'll get started here and see how it goes here's an introduction to the topics that we're going to cover today there's five issues in order to self-regulate the profession do you need to be a snitch and the, the answer is i don't think so i, I think that the, the rules are such that uh, they don't require you to rat out your partners or rat out others that are on the other side of a litigation but it's a much more complicated area than you might ex expect. So I thought we would walk through that just briefly. The second one is Nebraska's guidance on CCs, BCCs, and reply to all. And I'll get into what those mean a little bit more in, in, a, in, in a few minutes, but let's envision a situation where you get an invitation from, you're, you've sent an invitation to the entire law firm for a meeting over lunch. Let me see if I can get rid of the feet. Everybody still hear me? Yeah. Now, can you hear me? Okay. All right. So, you get an invitation to the entire law firm for a meeting over lunch. The RSV, RSVP is requested along with your choice of a sandwich. Joe Attorney responds by emailing everyone that he wants a chicken salad sandwich. How many times have you seen that situation where somebody emails the entire group saying something that nobody wants to hear? Uh, when he, all they have to do is hit reply and respond to the, to the original sender of the email. Well, the Advisory Committee on Ethics in Nebraska took on that issue, the reply to all issue, because it was apparently a big enough problem and people had requested assistance on it. So we're going to go through that a little bit and talk about the reply to all CCs and blind CCs. The next area is an Iowa case, an Iowa Supreme Court case. Are good intentions a defense to a rules of professional conduct violations? The answer is probably not. So we'll see uh, the circumstances of that case. The fourth issue, can a lawyer invest in a medical cannabis business? Uh, and the answer is uh, maybe, it depends. Uh, the advisory opinion is qualified. There's a dissent. Um, and so there's a lot of uh, care that needs to be exercised before you're gonna make those types of investments. And finally, the danger of curbstone opinions. Um, 
Do they create attorney-client relationships? Can you get sued over them? Can, you, can there claims be made? We'll just touch on that very briefly. So without further ado, we will move on to reporting of the misconduct. This is governed by Rule 8.3, and the, the rule is the same in Iowa and Nebraska, so I referenced the model rule. It, a lawyer who knows that another lawyer has committed a violation of the rules that raises a substantial question as to that lawyer's honesty, trustworthiness, or fitness as a lawyer, in other respects, shall inform the appropriate professional authority. So this, there's a lot in this rule, but it, it, it speaks to the levels of, of uh, compliance that, that need to be obtained before the rule really applies and before it cre creates a duty on you to report somebody. First of all, you have to have personal knowledge. If you don't have personal knowledge, you can't base your conjecture or base your complaint on uh, innuendo or rumors or those sorts of things. You can't also rely on your, your client. You can't be information you obtain from your client because that's related to the representation. That means it's confidential. So it has to be a substantial question, not just any question, not just some issue, but it needs to be substantial. And then it has to involve just the lawyer's honesty or trustworthiness or fitness as a lawyer. That leaves a lot of things out. There's a lot of things that you, you can do that are wrong, that are screw ups, that don't impact your honesty or your trustworthiness or your fitness as a lawyer. So if it's one of those areas, you don't have a duty to report it anyhow. And then who do you report it to? You heard it here first, hopefully. Don't report it to the judge. Don't tell a judge that there's a problem with another lawyer's conduct because that won't reflect well on you or the other lawyer. Instead, make that uh, communication to the counsel for discipline. That's uh, Mark Weber in this case in, in, in Nebraska. If it's an area of fitness to practice because of mental, mental illness, dependency, or, or some sort of addiction, then I'm sure Mark will take the, the, the matter and then turn it over to the State Bar Association and lab uh, section where um, we have somebody that handles those matters exclusively, works on those matters professionally. So there is somebody that has experience doing that. And we, uh, we're we lucky to have, uh, his name escapes me at the minute, but we're lucky to have him. All right, so the attorney's obligation to Rule 8.3 should be read together with Comment 2 to Rule 8.4. And you've heard me talk a bit before about Rule 8.4 as being the sledgehammer. That's the rule that impacts attorney's conduct. And if you've done some, something that's dishonest, something that lacks moral turpitude, you're going to be prosecuted under Rule 8.4 by the Council of Discipline. So that's what I mean by the sledgehammer. It, it, it's, it's used on in even the most basic, simple violations. But if you've got a situation where uh, 8.3 applies, and you're reading it along with 8.4, why does 8.4 applies? Well, 8.4 gives you further indication or further explanation as to what is the type of conduct you need to report. Many con types of conduct report, reflect adversely on fitness to practice, such as I referred to, you know, also involving fraud, willful failure to file an income tax return. <clears throat> Note the willful failure, not the negligent failure, not the forgetfulness, but the willful failure. And traditionally, th those are distinctions that are drawn in terms of moral ter turpitude. So if you need a rule of thumb, if it's a moral turpitude, ter turpitude issue, then you've got an obligation, at least at the outset, you've got an obligation to report it, assuming you satisfy all the other requirements. Comment two of rule 8.4 goes on to talk about moral, moral, moral turpitude and says that not everything is moral turpitude, such as adultery, comparable offenses, campaign finance, uh, litigation and, and the violations has been, have been in the press recently. Those aren't uh, covered by moral turpitude. You wouldn't have a duty to report those. And just as we see in investing in a cannabis business, as we'll see later today, those don't re require reporting as well. So there's, a, there's certain things you report, certain things you don't report. And the test is, should a lawyer be professional, professionally answerable for the offenses that will indicate lack of those characteristics. And professionally meaning it's not criminal law, it's not being prosecuted as a crime, but should the Council for Discipline look at it? And it applies to instances of violence, dishonesty, serious interference with the administration of justice, which has to be con con compared to or contrasted with interference with the administration of justice that aren't serious. Now, who knows what those are? 
but that's what the rule says. It, it's, it applies to serious interference with administration of justice. Rule 8.3 also requires that the reporting not lawyer have actual knowledge, meaning personal knowledge. So as I said before, no rumors, no inferences, no tactics. And what I mean by that is if it's an opposing counsel that you think you're, you may want to report, you know, the, the concern is that you're, you're doing so to benefit your client in a particular case. And so it, it's one of the things that Mark Weber would be interested in or that your trial court judge would be interested in is why are you doing this? Do you, do you have an ulterior motive? And you can't have any of those ulterior motives. You can't have any tactical strategy to, to get somebody out of the case by reporting. And this is where the, the rule really, I think, gets a little bit more lenient because it requires that lawyers use a measure of judgment. It doesn't apply to de minimis violations. And so that gives you a lot of leeway to determine whether this, in, the, in your own judgment, whether this is something that should be reported. It's a necessary limitation. I said it's like defining pornography. What do I mean by that? Well, the United States Supreme Court Justice, I forget who it was now, uh, but he once said he had a case before him where they were trying to determine what was pornography and whether it was banned or not. And he said, well, I know pornography because I, I know it when I see it. So it's a lot like Rule 8.3 violations. The measure of judgment requires you to you know it when you see it, trust your gut, but it's not for everything, and it should be really vetted out before there's any type of uh, violation reported. The rule is not mandatory in all states. It is in Nebraska. It is in Iowa. You should report if these other criteria are met. However, for example, Georgia's Rule 8.3 says you shall, I'm sorry, it says you should, whereas our rule in, in Nebraska and Iowa says shall, meaning it's mandatory. Georgia is softer and it says you should inform the appropriate professional authority. So how much less mandatory is that? I'm not quite sure, but it's different and it's more lenient than Iowa and Nebraska. Another limitation on the rule is that it, if it's protected by Rule 1.6, which is confidentiality, that's information gained by, by a lawyer during the course of the representation. This is something we talked about a long time ago and it comes up occasionally, and that is confidentiality is a very broad concept. It's not just what you tell your client. It's not just what your client tells you. It's all the information that you acquire in the course of a representation that's confidential. Now, the, the client may agree that you can disclose it. There may be implied reasons why the, you can disclose it. But still, the confidentiality of certain information can be very broad. And so you need to be careful that you don't make, base your complaint or your reporting of someone based on confidential information that the client doesn't want out there. In many cases, as I said, there's no duty to report because what the lawyers know about the misconduct is related to Rule 1.6, which is confidentiality. But in, in confidentiality matters, and under Rule 1.6, under, under rule you can get the client's consent. But I would urge you not to seek the client's consent to disclose something unless you're absolutely sure that this is a decision that, or this is actions that need to be reported and that uh, the the uh, counsel for discipline needs to be aware of what's going on. So remember, this is the, the, the rule we started off with with 8.3. The application is really quite limited because when you factor in all the criteria that you have to require to adhere to, um, and we're not talking about, I should say, situations where mental illness, addiction, uh, those types of things are being a problem, but those can be addressed in the context of the rule, particularly with the counsel for discipline. And uh, Opperly is the guy's name at the Nebraska State Bar Association that would handle those. Chris Opperly. All right, so let's go on to the Nebraska Ethics Advisory Opinion 2301. Questions presented, there's two of them. May lawyers carbon copy, which is CC, or blind carbon copy, which is BCC, her client on an email to opposing counsel. This is a 2023 opinion. This just came down within the last few months. And they reference the term carbon copy. And I don't know how, how many people remember that term. <laughs> I, I, I thought it was courtesy copy. But I can I can remember my secretary, my, my legal assistant back 20, 30, 40 years ago, I guess, taking that carbon paper and putting it behind a piece of letterhead, putting another piece of paper on it, put, putting it in the typewriter. It was a typewriter at that time. And <laughs> typing out whatever the letter was, 
such that what would be left is the original, which you would sign, and then there would be a, quote, carbon copy. So that's what the, the rule defines uh, CC to mean. It could also mean courtesy copy, but it basically it's any time you're including somebody at the bottom of a the letter, they're getting a copy of it. There's also blind carbon copy, and that's just where you're not putting the, the, the CC there to indicate that the person is getting a copy, but you're sending it to, for example, a client nonetheless. The second issue is, does a lawyer receiving the email violate the rules of professional conduct by replying all or replying to all? to an email where opposing counsel has CC'd opposing counsel's own client. So what does that mean? Let's say you CC your client on a letter and you send it out to the other side. What's the, the rights, what are the rights and obligations of the lawyer receiving that vis-a-vis -vis the person that's CC'd, which is the opposing client? There's a sending lawyer for number one, there's a receiving lawyer for number two. So what do we mean by those? Well, there's three rules that apply here. 3-504.2, which is rule 4.2, deals with dealing with the opposing party's counsel or lawyer, excuse me, client. So that if the lawyer that is sending the letter CCs his client or blind CCs his client, he's undertaking certain representations. I had don't open the door here. What I mean by that is if you are that client that's going to want to CC your, your client on the bottom of the letter, don't do it because you're opening the door for the other lawyer than to respond to your client as well. Under professional uh, communications rule 1.4, you got a duty to communicate with your client. So you need to be sending clients letters. It's just, how do you do it? And this rule, this opinion gives us some insight into that. And then last, rule 1.6 talks about confidentiality of information. And really what that applies to here is, you would be surprised what information is deemed to be confidential that can be disclosed if you simply CC or CC your client on the bottom of the letter. We'll get into that a little bit. Some, the uh, opinion summary talked about two things, and I get them confused all the time. One is informed consent, and the other one is implied consent. The first one talks about informed consent. That's category number one. And it says clearly in the opinion that you can't CC your, your client on an email to opposing counsel unless the client has given informed consent to the disclosure of their identity and email address. Now, if it's litigation, they already know who your client is, but it could be a transactional matter. It could be a matter that hasn't reached litigation that it's not clear who the client is. That would make that confidential information. There's also ways you could waive the privilege existing between your client, depending on you and your client, depending on what information is disclosed in that letter. So you need to get informed consent from your client before you can CC them on your letters that are going to somebody else, whether it be opposing counsel, whether it be some third party, get their informed consent. Otherwise, don't do it. Lawyers who CC their clients without their clients informed consent violate, this is may violate, it, they do violate rule 1.6. It's going to depend on the information disclosed as to the context and the extent of the violation. So it's not recommended because of this violation language to CC your client on letters. The potential confidential information that exists could be the client identity, that the client simply received the email, that the client is on notice of what's contained in the email, that there's uh, information there about the scope of representation. These are all the types of things, settlement offers, that, that the clients could be asked in depositions by pulling out, a student lawyer could pull out the letter, show the client where he was CC'd or she was CC'd on something, and start asking them questions about the contents of the letter. Was your attorney authorized to go into these areas? Was this something that you knew about? I mean, you can avoid all those types of problems, as the opinion is saying, by leaving your client off the CC. This is the second half. This is the second question, and it's from the standpoint of the receiving lawyer. The other lawyer has CC'd his client on an email to opposing counsel, which let's say it's me. He's given me implied consent from his client to reply to all in response to the communication. And let's think about that. Lawyer A CCs his client on the letter he sends to me. I want to respond to it. What this opinion says is through the implied consent doctrine, this, I, I'm able to respond to everybody. I'm able to reply to all because the lawyer opened the door. It, that means that I, the opposing counsel, get to talk to your client. Think about that. 
they can make comments about you. You know, this your lawyer is the best lawyer in the world, or your lawyer is the worst lawyer in the world, or your lawyer settles everything. You're not taking this to trial. I don't believe that. Or comments regarding the client themselves. You know, your client's a bad actor. I'm going to do all this stuff to him during cross examination when I take his deposition, that sort of thing. All that is fair game because you've opened the door because you cc'd your client to allow the opposing lawyer then to respond by replying to all. And your client gets a letter from opposing counsel. That's not anything that I think we want to do. Lawyers may also blind cc their client on, on an email that the process is not, the practice is not recommended. Let me go further with, than that. This is my pet peeve. Blind CCs, just because there is that field in an email a two and CC and, and blind CC if you, if you incorporate it into your emails, just because it's possible to do it doesn't mean you should do it. Blind CCs are, are the, the big, pose the biggest danger in my opinion because they're, they're, they, the, the client doesn't realize that they're blind CC. They think they're just responding to you, their lawyer. And if that happens, they could respond by blurting out something and sending it to the opposing counsel without ever thinking that the opposing counsel is going to be a recipient of that email. So that's why blind CCs are different from CCs. At least with CCs, you know that you're, you, the informed consent is needed. With the blind CCs, it's different. The client could be totally in the dark and say something that could really hurt them, their interests or be against their interests. So avoid that at all, at all costs. If not, it's, not, if it's not recommended by the rules. And why I say haste, well, what I mean by that is lawyers may be tempted to blind CC or CC their clients just to keep their clients informed under the duty to communicate. It's one less thing you got to do. You don't have to send them another letter. You don't have to send them another email because um, they're, they're going to get a copy of your email and then they're going to get a copy of, of the other email to the opposing counsel. Well, you do have a duty to communicate, but the danger is that under this reply to all situation, the, the person doesn't realize it or they don't know how to work their controls on their computer. For example, the Joe attorney example, where he tells everybody in the firm that he wants a chicken salad sandwich for the function at, at the lunch coming up. He didn't need to respond to everybody, but that's a situation where blind CC does not work. Although in that, in, that, in that example, it's not a bad problem, but it could be if you're dealing with a client or you're dealing with an expert uh, and you could end up seeing your letter on cross-examination being used against your client or your expert. So, this creates the potential for the client to respond inadvertently to disclose privileged information. You are in charge. You're charged with the obligation to make sure the client doesn't inadvertently disclose privileged communications. So, what does that mean? How is this your problem? Well, un under the advisory opinion, using either CC or blind CC creates a foreseeable risk that the client will reply to all. Your uh, by use of those no fields on your email. It creates a foreseeable risk that the client's going to do something against their interest. And that's something you're charged with, not the client. You're charged with knowing that the client should or the client may act in that fashion. And if the client does, who's responsible? Well, under this opinion, you are. So there's better methods of keeping clients informed than a CC or a blind CC. And it takes one more letter. It takes one more email. But I would urge you to do this instead of using the CC or blind CC shortcut. So send them a separate letter, attach the, the, the first letter uh, either in, in paper form or email form so that uh, the separately forwarded letter can end up in the client's hands and not something that is potentially uh, having more ramifications. So again, be careful with the effect of the implied consent and informed consent. Remember that the implied consent goes to the lawyer that wants to respond back to your client. The informed consent is if you want to use your client as a CC, you've got to get their informed consent. I would recommend that you don't do that and that you don't undertake that practice. Finally, there is a statement in, in the rule that talks about lawyers who say, well, okay, my client's a CC on here, but I'm telling you right up front and I'm giving you notice that this doesn't mean you can reply to all in your response. If you're going to go to that effort to tell the opposing counsel you can't reply, respond to my client, then why are you doing it in the first place? So it's not realistic and that's not advice. All right, we're going to talk about an Iowa case now. And this falls under the uh, RPC violations, or good intentions of defense. We'll find out in this case. 
the respondent, the respondent attorney, I'm going to refer to him as respondent throughout this. He had no previous history of discipline in practice in Manning, Iowa, since 1976 for about 47 years with no problems. And I can tell you that things in small town Iowa are a little different. Sometimes they're a little bit more casual. Sometimes they're a little bit more based on relationships than they are on rules. But nevertheless, this was a, a good relationship between a client and a lawyer. The client lived in the outskirts of Manila, uh, Iowa, uh, in a trailer house, and he earned about $20,000 a year. So he, his me means were very modest. If you're wondering where Manning and Manila are, if you know where Denison is, you've gone too far north. You know where Harlan is, you're too far south, or somewhere in between the two. So it's right, in, right in the middle of really nowhere when it comes to, and I get to say that because I'm from Iowa. Right. Okay. For approximately 20 years, the respondent performed legal work for the client without charging him, which was great, pro bono work. We like to see that, we encourage that. Respondent also served as the client's power of attorney for both financial and medical purposes. The, the, the case in, in, in the books that comes from the Supreme Court indicated or did not indicate that the client had any family, no kids, no wife, no widow, no nothing. So it was a situation where uh, he was looking for somebody to help him. And this, this respondent, this lawyer, was, was certainly willing to help him and, and did for all in, intents and purposes. He was a great help to this guy. They had lunch together. The respondent always paid. They had dinner together around the holidays. They did things, engaged in social functions together. They, they were friends and, and the, the relationship between the two was good for both of them. And frankly, it reflected well on lawyers as well, especially on the pro bono uh, side of things. Respondent testified when the client needed money, he, would, he, the respondent, would buy the property from the client. But there weren't any negotiations. There was no capacity issue that was indicated in the opinion. There's nothing to indicate that the client didn't know what he was doing when he was disposing of his property. The respondent simply paid the amount that the client requested for each piece of property. Now, it doesn't say in the opinion that the client paid, that the respondent paid fair market value, but there's no indication that that wasn't the case. So we have to assume when he paid the amount the client requested, that the client was requesting an amount that was fair market value. So he wasn't incurring a loss or wasn't being damaged by this transaction. From 2007 to 2013, again, this goes way back, the attorney purchased equipment and real estate having a total value of about $51,000. So I, give, I tell you that because the dates are important. Then the most recent of these transactions was eight years prior to the client's death, which was March of 2021. So you're probably thinking, okay, why do I have practice alert here? And you're, the reason I had that there is that you're probably thinking, this is a stale case. A lot of this stuff happened a long time ago. Why are we, why are we hearing about this? Well, let me give you a side note here about time limitations in Iowa and in Nebraska. Same rule applies here, five years for a trust account. So you only you have to keep your trust account records for each client for five years. I recommend you do that, or if you're gonna keep them seven years or 10 years or, or forever, then if you do that, make sure you keep all your records for five years or 10 years or forever. Don't be selective. Don't. So hold on to one set of records because you think, well, this guy might be a problem at some time in the future. Be consistent. So you're better off being consistent if you're going to go beyond the five years, but you are bound for five years. There's also in Nebraska, for malpractice, two-year professional stand negligence statute of limitations. That's something we're all very familiar with. But under the Nimmer case, which we discussed here probably four or five years ago, there is no time limitation on the acts or omissions that can give rise to a discipline ch charge. So Mark, Mark Weber, as counsel for discipline, can go back as far as he wants. If he's got information, if he's got evidence that can take him, take him back further, he can go back further. And this, the malpractice statute of limitations doesn't apply. The trust account statute of limitations on five years doesn't apply. He can go back further, as indicated by the Supreme Court in, in the Nimmer case. So that's just an aside because we were getting off into a tangent a little bit there. So now I'm back to talking about the respondent, the Manning lawyer, but it's good information for you to have concerning ethics and this investigations and claims. Respondent prepared the client's last will and testament 2017. The primary beneficiary was respondent's son. Hmm, maybe that a bit of a connection there that isn't, isn't necessarily a good one, but certainly not disqualifying. The real estate received by the son through, through the will assessed a value of $38,000. However, after the taxes were paid and the funeral expenses paid and the dilapidated structures removed, there was only $5,700 left. 
It wasn't much. So the client's cousins were also concerned about the will since they were only left photos and memorabilia. And this is a common refrain that we see in will contest cases. Somebody gets left out, somebody thinks that they should have been covered or should have been remembered. And so they start making a problem. They were obviously disgruntled. And so the respondent's son, who remember was the primary beneficiary, offered to turn over the entire client's estate to them if they would simply reimburse him for the funeral expenses that he incurred as, as the executor or personal representative. And the cousins declined, so he thought that was the end of it. But there was also a friend of the deceased, apparently he had another friend, who was told by the client that he was the beneficiary under his will, but he received nothing. And he was the one that went to the Council for Discipline in Iowa and filed a complaint with the Attorney Disciplinary Board. So it was a disgruntled friend that brought this to the attention of the uh, ethics authorities in Iowa, who then un undertook the investigation. We went to the Grievance Commission. The report recommended a public reprimand. Even good deeds will be punished if lawyers don't follow the rules of professional conduct was basically the holding of that case. Well, the respondent lawyer appealed to the Iowa Supreme Court. Now, let me give you a little context for the appeal and the information that came out in the appeal. First of all, as I said before, the respondent drafted the will. The respondent's son was the primary beneficiary of the client's estate. We knew that. But then we find out the respondent's wife was designated as the PR or executor of the will. Then we find out the respondent's daughter was the attorney for the executor. But at some point, perception does become reality. If, if you're the disgruntled employee, or excuse me, not employee, but this disgruntled friend, and you were told you're going to get something, and everything's going to the respondent or his kids, and all the administration of the estate has the respondent's fingerprints on it. It doesn't sound right. It doesn't feel right. So what the court did and what the Grievance Commission and both the Iowa Supreme Court did is they looked at Rule 1.8, 1 and that was, that's the requirement for writings. And there are some obligations that if you're going to, a lawyer is going to engage in transactions with the client, you've got to follow the rules. You can have all the good intentions of the, wor in the, of the world, but if you don't follow the rules, you create arguably a problem. You leave the door open for somebody like the disgruntled friend to come in and say, you shouldn't have done that. You were too close to it. You should have had something in writing. And that's what Rule 1.8 is for. So as I put them on the screen, you can read those as to what the requirements for a writing are. But basically, the client has to give informed consent in writing, signed by the client to the terms of the transaction. If he, if he does that, he's able to establish that this is what I want to do and this is what I, who I want to give it to. He can still do all that sort of thing, but it's got to be in writing. So... If the client, if, if he's informed, informed in writing about the risks, the existence of reasonably available alternatives, and let's talk about that for a second. Remember, we're in, in kind of middle central Iowa, and we, we don't know how many lawyers are in Manning or how many lawyers are in Manila. And maybe there wasn't a lawyer that was a suitable alternative. Maybe he was concerned about the cost of trying to solicit information from another lawyer. And the client said, the heck with that. I'm just going to go with the respondent, who's my friend and who I trust and who I've given powers of attorney to. So that kind of cushions the bowl a little bit about some of this independence that's required by uh, the writings. Okay. So the cost or the lack of alternatives are things which would support the manner in which the respondent handled this case. But the Supreme Court said, of Iowa said under de novo review that there, these were multiple business transactions with the client without fall, fall, falling that should be following the steps required by Rule 1.8 because there was no writing. So the respondent had a bunch of defenses. And as you will see from these defenses, they get weaker as we go on. In fact, there were four. The best defense was the first one. And that is under Rule 1.84, this was fair. There was no harm. There was no foul. Respondent offered the same items. If he had offered the same items to the public, the estate would have received nothing more in terms of compensation or value than if he then had the respondent paid for them or the respondent's son paid for them. So the price was high enough. The court said, well, fairness alone is not enough to satisfy the rule. One of those requirements, but only one, is the term, terms of the transaction be fair and reasonable. But even then, the respondent has to comply with Rule 1.8. He must still advise the client in, right of, in writing of the desirability of seeking the independent legal counsel. So while that may have been cumbersome, while it may have been costly, while it may have been time consuming, that was obligation, those were obligations that the lawyer had, the respondent had. 
So we're on to the next defense. We well, said, well, this is a standard commercial transaction. The Supreme Court said, well, no, it's not. This is, he's coming to you whenever he needs to sell equipment to live on. That's different from he's in the business of selling some, some, something that's got a clearly stated price. So they rejected that argument. Then he, he went to the third argument. Well, it wasn't a substantial gift. It was 5000 or 5700 That was the total value that he received. That, that couldn't be something that we're trying to regulate. Supreme Court said 5000 is enough to make it substantial. And you can see why they would say that. Finally, the respondent claimed he had a close familial relationship to be outside the scope of Rule 1.8. Well, the court didn't buy that because they noted, yes, you certainly had a friendship, but you didn't raise children together. You weren't living together in the same household. You didn't have the same siblings. So the court had no problem in rejecting that defense. So for these reasons, the court found that the client and the respondent were not related. So that Rule 18, Rule 1.8 did apply. So the sanctions, and considering the sanction, the court noted that the respondent argued, where is the grace given to me for helping a destitute elderly person? He's, he's crying out for some help here. And, and my response to that is, well, if you're looking for grace, don't go to the courthouse. <laughs> uh, if you want grace, go to church. Courthouse is where you get due process. And so that argument was, was not going to apply before it left the guy's mouth. Uh, and the court also seized upon that to note all the defenses that were raised. And this comment was an indication that there was a lack of re remorse on the part of the respondent. So at the end of the day, the court said, look, there's nothing here that you could not have, that says you could not have done both the compliance with the writings and then done everything else that you did to make this trans these transactions fair to the client. Charitable aims do not justify professional misconduct. And that's what happened. That was the ultimate conclusion of the court, that the, the guy who responded had all the good intentions of the world, and maybe there was some, some method to his madness in terms of how he was handling these things. But still, they were charitable aims, but you still have rules of professional conduct that need to be followed. So the public reprimand was affirmed by the court. All right, so then we get to the fastest five minutes in ethics. One of the things that I was going to talk about was a uh, arbitration award to a, against a Kansas City firm that was fairly large. And I just didn't feel comfortable getting into that right now. So maybe we'll talk about that next year. That's kind of the benefit of doing this, this train seminar the way I do it. I'm revising this outline right up to the last week before um, it, it comes to you. So what uh, the, the CLE representatives in, in, in Lincoln are approving or what, what they think I've done over the last 17 years and so far it's working, but it does help uh, make some last minute changes. So uh, this is when I stuck in because obviously this is a, a fairly recent decision by the Ethics Advisory Council in Nebraska. 22-03 means it was last year. And it, can an attorney invest in medical cannabis business in another state? Well, let, let me give you some of the background because it, it is a bit convoluted. Under federal law, use and possession of cannabis is illegal. Under Nebraska law, it is, it is also illegal. The uh, Controlled Substances Act determined the drug to be scheduled, meaning marijuana or cannabis, to be a Schedule One drug, meaning it has high potential for abuse and no accepted medical use. Well, we know there's medical use because there's many states where there's medicinal use of cannabis right now, and people swear by it. Uh, so the, the basis upon which the Controlled Substances Act says it, it has no accepted medical use the, the key is, is it accepted or not? It's not accepted by the federal government, apparently. But what they've done, what the federal government's done is under the Rock, Rohrabacher Farr Amendment, it, they have prohibited federal prosecution of individuals who are complying with the medical cannabis rules in their particular state. So that's what's happening in South Dakota, which is where this, uh, this Nebraska lawyer was wanting to invest. Uh, Nebraska did not permit, permit medicinal or recreational use but South Dakota recognized the legal use of medicinal cannabis. That's what he wanted to invest in. And that was the issue before the Ethics Advisory Council. Their, their, their holding was, well, you got federal law that says you can't do this. You got state law in Nebraska that says you can't do this. You got the rules of professional conduct says you have to obey the law. But nevertheless, the Nebraska attorney may invest in a medical cannabis operation in a state where the cannabis business is legal. So that at the end of the day, the advisory opinion says you can do this and you can invest across state lines. 
But be careful if you do that. Be careful if you want to do that because the opinion is qualified. It's limited to its facts. The, the lawyer has to remain compliant with all the other rules and all the other laws, which could change. The federal approach to the enforcement of the cannabis laws has to remain the way they are now, and God knows how, how they could change it at any time. And then there's a dissenting opinion that went on for pages uh, talking about how and why the, the, this uh, practice should not be allowed. So it's the opinion is like a piece of Swiss cheese. It says you can do it, but there's a lot of things you need to comply with to make sure that you can. So just be aware that that's part of where you're going to put your portfolio. You've got a lot of steps to walk through before you can do that. The dissent noted the conflict of laws between the boarding states, such as Nebraska and South, South Dakota, created a convoluted juxtaposition between state law, federal law, and the, the RPC. Interestingly, South Dakota adopted a new ethics rule that allowed their in-state in lawyers to invest in these types of businesses. We don't know what would happen if Nebraska law changed, but I don't think that's going to happen anytime in the near future. So last topic was the responding to informal legal requests for legal advice. I'm sure you've all been in that situation where somebody says, well, I'm not a lawyer, but, and then they're not constrained and they're not a lawyer, but then they're not constrained by telling you what their opinion is about anything, which is great. You know, keep going. That's great. But you've also, I'm sure, been in a situation where it'd be a social gathering or a bar or tavern or party or art gallery, as we heard earlier today, um, where there's an off-the-cuff request for legal advice. That people say, hey, you're a lawyer. What about this? What about that? And all of a sudden, you're, you're expected to know all this information about whatever they want to ask you about because you're a lawyer. Well, that's a great thing that we're lawyers. We should be proud of that. Uh, but off-the-cuff request for legal advice without more it's usually not sufficient to create an attorney-client relationship, meaning they shouldn't rely, the person asking the question should not rely on your response for purposes of governing them, themselves. Where we usually see this in medical malpractice cases, where they had a problem with the doctor and there's a statute of limitations issue, or, and, and so they're, they're more inclined to act on the response, the response or the information or the advice given by somebody that they trust who may not be their lawyer. That doesn't mean it's actionable, but uh, it does happen. So what, do you, what should you do? You can politely decline the request and refer the individual to somebody else, point them in the right direction, or excuse yourself and go to the bathroom. <laughs> I think you should do any of those. Any of those is fine. So that's the, the clue for that one. So what have we learned? Think carefully before you report another lawyer for disciplinary action. There's a lot more to it than just you think somebody did something wrong. There's no statute of limitations on disciplinary matters under the rules of professional conduct. Good intentions or lack of harm will not serve as a defense to RPC violations. And don't CC your clients and never, ever use blind carbon copies with your clients. Come back and see us next year for our ATP. Thank you.